So uh, let's talk about your comicsology original with Scott Snyder, Canary. Okay. Uh, how did you get roped into this project? Pun intended. Um, Scott and I are old uh, poker buddies. And uh, we actually, I wouldn't even say buddies. We never really got along that well. And, but I lost a bet and here I am. No, I'm kidding. Is that serious? I was going to no. be able to <laughs> Welcome back to the Comic Cube, everyone. I am with Dan Urban Barbarian Panosian. How are you today? Good. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Um, for the most part, we will be talking about your Comicsology original, Canary, with Scott Snyder. But before we do that, there's one question that I ask everyone who first comes on the show, which is, what is it that you love about comics? Uh, I like the escape. To me, it's a it's a uh, it's a good little diversion from life. You kind of lose yourself in comics when you're reading them. Everything kind of stops around you, and you're all invested in 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 that story. Ideally, you know. Do you also lose yourself when you know from life when you're drawing them? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, for me, it's when I'm doing something that I, if I'm doing a cover or a page that I'm really into. I, I get that same feeling I had when I was like, you know, 13, 14 years old reading comics and enjoying them. I'm like, it kind of boggles my mind sometimes. I'm like, I'm actually, you know, a part of this now. And uh, I don't know. I, I, in a weird way, I'm like, I hope some of this stuff might inspire people the way I was inspired by the artists and writers that, you know, I, I picked up comic book wise growing up. Still, all, all these years later, you still feel weirded out by the fact that you're in the comic book business? Yeah, I do. I feel like they let me in by accident. You know, so, I, I hear that a lot from you artists. Yeah. Like, uh, that's a good thing, probably. It keeps people humble, you know? Yeah. Humility is, you know, you find those guys and, you know, some of them definitely deserve the accolades, but when they, they lose that sense of humility, I think it it, it stops their, their growth. You know, it's hard. it's hard to if you're drinking your own punch to really uh, aspire to learn new things or absorb uh, other things from other artists and other writers, you know, it's um, there's so much to be inspired by. What were your favorite comics growing up? I mean, I really, I started off with um, Conan. So I was reading a lot of Roy Thomas and, and looking at John Buscema. Uh, and that, that kind of was like a gateway comic into Heavy Metal Magazine, uh, Creepy and Eerie. Those were Warren publications at the time. And then um, in Savage Sword, they used to have uh, these advertisements for the X-Men. And I was like, I was looking at the X-Men and I was like, man, that looks really interesting. I think it was like a Dave Cockrum, um, you know, group shot. And I was like, oh, I can kind of get into that. It's probably Wolverine that, that pulled me in. But then I, and I started getting really back into that. When I was a little kid, I liked... Uh, my dad would buy me like oversized um, Batman comics and stuff, you know, when I was real, real little and read them to me, which is kind of nice of him. In an Adam West voice? Uh, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I should be so lucky. That'd be awesome. So uh, quick digression, because you mentioned Conan. I have to ask, who do you think was John Buscema's best inker? Oh, Tony Zuckerman. Oh, okay. Yeah, without a doubt, that was the... That stuff just, there was just something powerful about it. Those are real choppy, confident inks. And then he would use a variety of different zipatones um, on top of it. But it was, there was something really tough about that Conan. Like he really, he really brought a lot to the table. I mean, almost everyone who inked him was, was really cool. You know, I think Ernie Chan probably inked him the most. And there was something very organic about that. But when, when Tony inked him, uh, for me, that was like, I think hopefully there's a little bit of Tony's work in my work. You know, I like to put a little punch and snap into the, into the uh, inking aspect of what I do. That was going to be my next question. When did you realize that you wanted to make comics? Uh, I was about 14, I think. Um, I had started a online, not, <laughs> like my, as, if, as if there was online back then. I started, I had started a, um, a small company that specialized in drawing character um, designs for your role-playing game characters. So if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or any other, you know, different role-playing games, if you sent in a, um, a character sheet that I would 
you know, correspond with you and just filled it out, I would draw that character. So it kind of taught me how to draw a little bit more and be conscious of, of deadlines and run a business. And uh, it's probably around then. It's called right. Anvil Enterprises. At 14. At 14. Yeah, I love I love playing Dungeons and Dragons, but those books and the game modules are so expensive that, um, oh, that's Dave Johnson. I'll turn my phone off. Um, uh, they're so expensive. My parents were like, we can't afford to you know, do this. I mean, you'll, you'll have to get a job. So I got a job mowing lawns and I used that money to pay for an ad in the back of this publication called Dragon Magazine, which was the Dungeons and Dragons official magazine. And in there, you could send me a self-addressed stamp, stamped envelope and I'd send this character sheet. You'd fill it out and then I'd, I'd do this drawing. When, um, So when you started doing that, did you keep mowing lawns? No, <laughs> no. Before I even had a car, I think I, I was 15, uh, I, I had made enough money doing that that I, could, I bought a car. I couldn't drive it. It just sat in the driveway, but I was ready for that next stage because they weren't going to get me a car either. You know, so I was like, I got to do what I can here. Okay. I have to ask, because a lot of people, you know, their parents would be like, what are you make? What are you doing making a living out of art? <laughs> but now at 14, you've had, you have enough money to buy a car you know, yeah. with an art career. What did your parents think? Well, my dad was a professional. Um, he was an art director. Um, so he understood the art world, but he would always tell me, don't get into this. This is a, it's a tough, it is a tough road being an artist. I mean, it's not easy. I've been freelance the majority of my life. I've, there's very few occasions where I've had a contract. So it's always hoping that your work is good enough that there's another project waiting when, when one wraps up. Okay. Who are your uh, biggest influences when it comes to drawing? Early, early on, it was probably the artists that were very popular in the role-playing game uh, arena, which was Jeff D., um, Bill Willingham, who later went on to write Fables. Um, he was he was doing a lot of illustration. So I was looking at that. And then, of course, seeing all the John Buscema artwork, I'm sure that kind of seeped in, you know, and all those cool covers because they were painted covers. I was really big into Rosetta. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I think I was, I think it was probably it's John Byrne, Frank Miller, Walt Simonson, that sort of grouping, you know, I was really impressed with. Yeah, I can see, I can see some of that in your artwork. I was going to say, because I was oh. reading Canary and I was like, I think I see some Suryotopi in there. So, yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of Walt, Walt Simonson. I always think, I mean, who knows? I, he mentioned some of his influences the other day on Facebook. But when I see Sir, when I see Walt Simonson, I see a perfect amalgamation of Kirby and Sergio Topi. I, I think that he really kind of took those two things and made it his own. So, and obviously, I'm a big fan of Topi, like like most illustrators. You know, it's that guy's just you know he trailblazed in a way that you know other illustrators haven't haven't done it since. Mike Huddleston does a great. Um, kind of you can see the influence there but he still is his own animal his own machine i get that i think when you say when you say that about walt i'm like i, I get that i think he's got uh topi's texture and kirby's foreshortening yeah he brings a lot i mean walt's a great great artist he's he's amazing he's still amazing he's one of those guys like um you know joe kubert only got better and better you know he never a lot of artists decline after a few you know in their the twilight of their career and, and walt draws as well as he ever did maybe yeah. better he's probably a better artist now than he was when he, during his thor run no ragnarok is the best he's ever drawn yeah it's amazing <laughs> it's crazy he's, yeah he's an incredible artist and he is he doesn't tire he's just you know he's he just did a cover you know, I, I can't say the name of the book and or the publisher at the moment, but I'm writing a new book for a publisher and he just did a, a cover, like a variant cover for it. And I get to color it. So it's kind of a neat, uh, you know, I'll never get to ink him professionally, but I, I could, I'll be able to color him on this cover. So oh, because cool. he does his own inks. Yeah, he does, and, and he should. I mean, he's a great inker. I do my, like I do everything. I rarely, in, unless it's an impossible deadline, I'm going to do my own colors. So, yeah. Do you have a particular discipline of art that you prefer to be in, like penciling, inking, coloring? I like, I like every stage. I mean, the penciling is the most challenging, and it's 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 the Rubik's cube of the of the entire process because you're really, you know, you're trying to 
uh, take what's on the written page and and you know ideally you're not just um following the steps you're trying to do something special with it and and tell you it's 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 telling a story from your perspective or how you want the reader to um understand the pacing so you're really kind of imbuing your sensibilities um, artistically the inking for me is probably the easiest and most fun because i'm the most comfortable with that um and the coloring is another challenge i mean i'm, I'm semi new to coloring i've only been coloring for about 10 years which i guess for some would be a long time but for me that's not that long and there's you know the, the color palette and what you can do and what you see on the internet and instagram and uh you know art station at deviant art it's it's crazy uh there's just so many tremendous artists out there so there's so many things to pull from it's a little bit maddening i'll get back to that later how did you break into comics uh, again, it was from that company I started, Anvil Enterprises. There was a, um, a guy who would regularly um, pay me to illustrate his characters. And he said, hey, I'm drawing, a, I'm, I'm writing a comic book. I'd love for you to do some of the artwork in it. So I penciled some, pencil and inked a story. And I also got to ink um, Mark Bright, who is the premier Green Lantern artist at the time. And he also did, um, God, I think he... What did he do at Marvel? He was doing Power Man and Iron Fist for a little while. He was also there's a few of them he was doing that was really really cool stuff. He was a fantastic um, artist in the in the vein of Neil Adams, but he did his own thing. Anyhow, I got to ink him, and it, it's hard to look bad inking him. And uh, the guy the guy who commissioned me to do it was like, hey, there's there's this convention which is basically the New York um, Comic Con. At the time, he goes, and we're going to debut the comic. Would you like to come up and sign some comics? And I, w I, had, uh, I was kind of waffling. You know, I was doing construction work. I was working in um, restaurants. Uh, so I hadn't pulled the trigger on the comic book career yet. And I was, I was just about ready to turn 21. I was like, you know, I got to I gotta either do this or, you know, take, go, to, go to school full time and get a business degree. So I'm glad I I'm glad I did. Although sometimes I wish I was a dentist, but so I went up. To, I, I went to that show, and the, the day I was there, I met Joe Kubert, I met Neil Adams, and I met Walt Simonson. Neil Adams gave me a job inking um, some low-level books at his studios, Continuity Studios, and Walt Simonson called up his editor, um, Ralph Macchio, and said, "Hey, hire this kid." And he and I started doing backups at Marvel. It was, I mean, it was is literally off the bus sort of so to speak and into the frying pan so two questions about that you, uh, you did say when you were 15 you'd earned enough to buy a car but then at yeah. 21 you're doing these other well, these other jobs well, i mean i you know I, I think basically i mean i didn't I, it's not like i bought a lamborghini i bought you know i think i bought at the time it was like a three thousand dollar car but uh you know i wasn't you know rolling in money i was you know doing enough i i had in, i had entered that marvel comics that um i think it was a how to draw marvel comics book or something like that it was uh the, oh the marvel oh. comics tryout book so i had sent stuff in around the same age i was 14 and i sent stuff in and they wrote they wrote back to me and said here's how much money you'll make with us here's your insurance plan and that kind of was the best thing that happened but also the worst thing that could have happened because in the back of my mind i'm like oh once, once I'm old, once I'm 18, I can go work for Marvel, and you know everything will be fine. So I, 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 w I went from an honor roll student to not really caring about school at all because I had this. Oh, I'm, I'm going to work for Marvel, and I'm going to make more money than my father's making. You know, I. So it was a, it was a curse, also. <laughs> but it, so I waffled, and it, you know, and I didn't really. There wasn't a guarantee, but they were basically saying we're we're ready to hire you. I didn't know how to get hired necessarily. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a strange path there, but I made it. It's it's like what happens to every high school kid. Once they find out they get to college, <laughs> <laughs> you just stop studying. <laughs> yeah. Who was the standard in the business when you were just starting out? Would you say the guy that was up and coming was Jim Lee and Will Spertaccio. Those two guys were doing things that would, you know, change comics. Obviously, Todd McFarlane too, and Liefeld. I guess those, 
those four guys were the um, kind of trendsetters. So I, I changed the way I inked and approached comics because I was really into Jim Lee's um, work in particularly, you know, back then it was Scott Williams who was inking, you know, Wills and Jim. And there was nobody else, nobody else had really changed their styles yet to kind of mimic what Scott was doing. And I, I did. When I got to Marvel, I would, they would throw me little pinups as far as penciling. I could, I, occasionally I would do a backup story or like something in an annual, but I, w I wasn't ready to, to draw any books. So I was mostly, I was mostly inking. Is there, is there anyone in particular that you loved inking or found a challenge to ink? I guess well, those I mean, are two separate questions. Challenge. I mean, I loved inking Jeff Johnson. I, I worked with him for a long time on Wonder Man. And he 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 and I kind of, I thought we worked pretty well together. Um, I, I enjoyed inking Chris Vicello on an issue. We did the first issue of X-Men Unlimited. Um, I, I was always intimidated anytime I was inking or doing finishes on Jim Lee. You know, it's because, you know, it's, I was like, oh, it's Jim Lee. You know, it's kind of exciting. Is um, is that a case of uh, the Scott Williams finish is so patented on Jim? Yeah, it was that... like, you know, that, that was a problem. When, when you're mimicking someone's art style, you know, you're never going to surpass that person. The, the best thing you can do is kind of take what... take it's my alarm. Movie. Oh, <laughs> your alarm. Yeah. it's not Dave Johnson calling you, is it? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what, the, the best thing you could do is become a Travis Chere or Cheris, you know, and, and kind of like take that Jim Lee influence and, and go your own way with it after a little while. And that's, you know, that's eventually kind of what I had to do. I, you know, I, I, if I was still thinking, I'd be ideally, you know, Scott Williams, number two, you know, Scott Williams, Jr. But that's that's not a great aspiration in life. Do you do you consider anybody your mentors at the time? Um, I, I didn't really have too many teachers. I had um, Bill Ray, who was uh, he was directing uh, Ren and Stimpy uh, episodes. He uh, opened my eyes to a lot of classic illustrators. Um, uh, Mark Masella was um, drawing. Uh, X Force for Marvel after Rob Liefeld took off, and he, you know, you know, the style was the Rob Liefeld style, but he could draw in kind of a more classical uh, way. And he and Bill Ray were friends, so um, you know, he kind of broadened my artistic um, horizons. What do you think? Already, you know, I was already kind of interested in, you know, I wasn't just interested in Marvel or DC. I was, I was interested in you know, a lot of different uh, types of illustration, thanks to my father and, yeah. you know, influences like heavy metal and and creepy and eerie and old, uh, God, what was it, you know, like EC comics. I just oh. found them e weird and interesting, you know. EC's got such, like, a great standard of quality for, for their art and their storytelling. Like, I think those those hold up super well. Yeah. yeah. Do you... Uh, sorry, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> that one you have to take. <laughs> yeah, that one you have to you at least have to look at. Um, uh, what uh, what was it like being there at the forefront of the Image Revolution? Because you moved over to Image. Yeah, I, I had inked a um, the last issue of X Force with Rob, and I was already inking I think some X Men stuff. And Rob planned to go. I, mean, I didn't know Rob Liefeld, but he's like, "Hey, I'm starting this new company. I'd like you to, you know, be over here with us." So. I had made so much money. I'd never made money like that before because the royalties were insane. I was like, and he offered me even more. And Silvestri was offering me money to ink him on, um, uh, what was his book? Cyber Force. So I kind of had to choose. And Rob was like, I'll pay you more, you know, that, that type of thing. And um, so I, I ultimately went with, with Rob. Um, I got to ink, I think, one issue of Cyber Force, which was a lot of fun and, and challenging. I mean, he's a, talk about a guy who puts a lot of detail into his work you know yeah i was gonna say i feel like there's way more lines to ink with mark oh yeah no that was probably that and dale keown were probably the most you know time intensive as far as inking goes do you think it would have been i mean i think he just celebrated the anniversary of his birth but like do you think it would have been a challenge to ink somebody like gene colon oh yeah i've tried to ink gene colon with kind of so-so results 
He's not easy. I, but I do, what I do like is brush. I like using brush and dry brush. And you really have to be pretty versatile to ink someone like him. You know, you have to be like Tom Palmer. Tom Palmer was, you know, I think the best inker for Gene, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, another one we lost recently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so aside from that, the business aspect of being there at Image, did you feel any of that rock and roll fan aspect? That <laughs> Yeah, it was hard not to back then. I mean, you, you do signings, there'd be lines around the block. We were doing tours, like in you know the tour tour the counties counting crows tour bus was taking us all over california it was fun it was a great unusual time i I'm, feel blessed that i got to experience it you know made a lot of friends and um it was fantastic so why did you end up leaving comics for a while you know i think eventually the bottom kind of fell out you know with the 90s era you know that supply and demand the comic book companies were meeting the demand of the collectors and when you do that the comics don't become collectible anymore and they lose their value so collectors left so the bottom kind of fell out and and the companies financially didn't adjust quickly enough to compensate that so they're spending lavish amount of money like rolling in it just like the artists and the writers were and you, you just don't want that party to be over and nobody did so I, I recognized pretty early on it was it was going to fall apart and my dad had passed away and he was kind of my inspiration for for doing comics so i i just got into uh, advertising and video game design for a bit um store some a lot of storyboarding like commercial storyboarding uh, but it was good. It taught me how to, it actually, that experience taught me how to draw. And then eventually I, I just missed comics. I was like, man, I, I didn't start drawing to draw what I call drawing refrigerators. I'm like, I'm doing these storyboards for like car companies. And it's just, to me, that wasn't, that wasn't that fun. So I, I, I kind of gained enough experience from doing that to uh, try to try penciling out. That's interesting because here in the Philippines, a lot of people do both comics and work in advertising firms. And the thing mm -hmm. that they always say is that comics is a side gig because the advertising firm, oh, they is pay great. Like, they pay the they pay much better. Oh, so yeah, three times, four times more, and for less, much less work. Like you get one advertising gig a month, and you're set. You know, a, a comic book takes a long time. You know, to draw, most people can't draw a comic book in a month. It takes them a little bit longer because it. You know, people pour in so much detail. So why do you think that is uh, coming from the 90s, the 80s, the 90s, where some people could draw, you know, a book yeah. a month? Why why, why has the pace overall slowed down over, well, over the I last mean, I think years? Well, general, generally the excuse would be the amount of detail. But then you have people like Greg Capullo, who are, could be a monthly guy, technically. I don't know if he does 12 issues a year, but he at least does eight or nine. You know, he's there's plenty of guys like that. Ryan Stegman is a a machine. I mean, he's a guy who puts in a lot of detail. The pages are a lot of fun and he still can maintain a monthly deadline. It's very rare. Those guys are like unicorns. Um, I could do I can draw a page a day, but I can't you know, I can't pencil ink and color a page a day. I, I I'll draw like a cover pencil ink and color that. But it's a long day. Has going digital helped speed things up at all or? Well, I mean, I, I draw analog, yeah. so I, I draw by hand on paper, and then I scan it in, so the coloring is uh, digital. That certainly is a much faster process. So uh, let's talk about your Comixology original with Scott Snyder, Canary. Okay. Uh, how did you get roped into this project, pun intended? Um, Scott and I are old uh, poker buddies, and uh, we actually... I wouldn't even say buddies. We never really got along that well. And, but I lost a bet and here I am. No, I'm kidding. Is that serious? I was going to no. Be like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, I, Scott and I had talked about working together. I, I always wanted to work with the guy. I, I love his writing ever since um, American Vampire with uh, Raphael Albuquerque and, um, you know, who, how do you say no to that guy? You can't. And they, and Scott's so easy to work with. He was like, oh, what do you think about a Western? I'm like, geez, I, I love that genre. That'd be so much fun, you know? You get to so, pretend you're Mobius uh, every day. Blueberry. Although I'm not pulling out the Mobius while I'm working on it. I should. Um, 
but I, you know, I guess all that stuff like the Busema is just baked into my head. At this well, point. if you pulled out the Mobius now, it would be a pretty big stylistic shift. Would it? Oh yeah. No, I, I don't know if I could, I mean, I don't even, I don't think I could ape that style too well. I'd have to really change the way I draw. And like, and like I mentioned with the Scott Williams stuff, it would just be second rate Mobius. So nobody wants that. What what did you think when Scott told you that he wanted to do a whole line where he's writing like eight books? He's insane. The guy's I don't know how he does it. And he's got like a hundred children. So my hat's off to the dude. It's pretty incredible. In different genres too. Oh yeah. No, it's all like you I, I saw you interviewed uh Jamal. Yeah. You know, he's doing like a kind of a all ages sort of adventure story and you know, with, he's doing one, he's doing a, another horror book. Uh, I, he's doing Barnstormers. I mean, that's just the comic, that's just the best jacket stuff for comiXology, not to mention all the stuff he's doing for Image and IDW and, you know, who else? He just he's got to be a workaholic. What, so with that kind of, uh, with that kind of versatility as a writer, how, how would the, how would you work with someone like that? Like what kind of script would you get? Is it a full so, script? How much back and forth do you do? It's, uh, you know, the first couple issues were just uh, like plot. We call that Marvel style, um, early Marvel style. Now, now everybody uses full scripts, but I think because maybe because I'm a writer or just for some crazy reasons, Scott trusts me to uh, interpret the story. I, you know, when you're working with a plot, you kind of determine how many panels or how you want to tell those story points. And then Scott will come back in and script it. So it's a very fun collaborative way to, to work on a story. And the artist and writer have to have a lot of trust in each other to, to make that work, particularly the writer. I mean, the writer is really taking it, a chance with the artwork because you don't know what you're going to get. You know, if, if let's say Sam Keith was drawing Canary, you know, and you gave him a plot, who knows what that would look like? It'd look incredible, but it would look very different from from my approach. You know, if Sean Murphy did it, if Dave Johnson, if Simonson, you know, Frank Cho, who knows? You know, it's it's a gamble. So those are all very different books. I feel like yeah, that each one is a different book. It's completely different, despite the writing being the same, you know. I, I feel like that's something that a lot of uh, comics critics or even fans like kind of miss the point on is because like a lot of us will kind of overvalue the contribution of the writer and, you know, never mention the artist in a review or something. And I'm yeah, like, happens. Scott's anyone... pretty good about that. Scott's very collaborative, luckily, you know, and also if I have an idea, he'll, I've never heard him say no. You know, it's that which is interesting. You know, he'll always go, "That sounds great. Let's do it." So it's a nice feeling. What is the uh, quick elevator pitch for Canary? Uh, it, I mean, Scott has his his version, and mine would be just be it's it's a uh, weird and interesting take on the classic American western uh, meets a horror film, and it's almost a zombie film, but it's they're not zombies. It's, it's a, we, he's really kind of crafted an interesting world here. And it's, it's, it's from Scott's perspective and, and mine, it's, it's, it kind of mirrors where our society is going or is heading in a, in a, even in a, a world sense, in a global sense, because um, maybe because of uh, media and sensationalism, like the violence aspect of the uh, of what's happening to the world. I think the world's becoming a little bit more violent, and I think uh, as as a um, as a people, I think we're conditioned now to almost accept some of this stuff like it's normal. So this that sort of thing is starting to happen in this um, Western landscape, and the main character uh, Marshall Holt is kind of noticing this shift in what's happening, and no one else is really catching on to it yet. But he he is, and um, it's a it's a bit of a mystery. Like it, it's it's kind of like the best of detective comics with Batman. Like when Batman is actually solving a mystery, like a, a Sherlock Holmes thing. Well, so the main character is trying to piece what's happening together and and try to find like some rhyme and reason to these horrible acts of violence and and where they're originating from. Is it? Uh... Is it a limited series? Is there a finite end it to this? Is. 
There it is. We're, we're going seven issues, but um, you know, like anything, I, we had some ideas to continue the series. It, it's kind of a, it, it can go very big um, because there'll, there'll still be some very big possibilities after seven issues. Like it, it could be over, it could not be over. Can you talk about coming up with a design for Marshall Holt? Uh, what he's wearing, the mask? Oh, that, yeah. Well, Scott and I, there's so many different versions of that mask, which is fun. Um, and finally, we arrived on it. And I don't know how we figured it out. But, you know, especially when we started this thing, nobody was wearing masks, you know, for the, for the pandemic. And now it's like, oh, mask is kind of a normal thing. And here in the States, a lot of people will wear a handkerchief instead of like a surgical mask. Um, but yeah, the mask was obviously a big part of it. I wanted him to wear kind of all black. So there, there's that, he's kind of a s scary kind of guy. Like, you know, Batman's a good guy, but he wears all black. The Punisher is wearing black. And I wanted to give him a unique look. So I gave him kind of a pinstripe suit. And his cowboy hat is not this typical cowboy hat either. It's kind of tall. It's unusual. It's a little bit, maybe it's a little bit gothic in a sense. I don't know, but it's different. And I, I didn't want to just draw the standard western looking guy are the pinstripes hard to draw <laughs> they're the fun part <laughs> okay <laughs> because i put those in on color i, I don't draw them on the uh, page that way i just because uh, i know i'm going to color it and, and put that stuff in <laughs> i'm looking at it and i'm like wow he does that every panel <laughs> yeah it's fun it's like it's you know like if you have to draw spider-man all those little annoying webs it's annoying <laughs> but it's you know after a while it's kind of cool uh, one of the things that strikes me, of course, is that the fact that this is a Western and that we haven't seen one of those in a long time or yeah. the proliferation of it. Uh, what is the draw for you after all of these years, you know, the Westerns, uh, what is the attraction? Well, I think growing up in the, in the United States, the Western is like, you know, I guess if, you know, we, we didn't have like cool samurais or ninjas or, you know, Arthurian knights, you know, like Great Britain, we had cowboys and, you know, that's, that's our legend and lore, you know, that's, and so growing up, just watching all sorts of cool films and my middle name's Duke. So my, like um, John Wayne, the Duke, my dad loved Western. So I grew up watching a lot of Western. So um, it's, it's kind of a, once again, a way to feel that cool nostalgia. Daniel Duke Panosian? Yeah. That's awesome. I should I should have you know like Mark Texiera calls himself Tex. Yeah. I should have I should have just called myself Duke and left it at that. Like one name, like you know, Madonna or you know, Lady Gaga. I would have had just Duke. That I think I would have who knows what, what a career I would have had. Can you talk about the color palette of this book? Because I feel like it's uh you know, you're not gonna see this color palette in a movie. You're right. not going to see it again after I'm done with it either, hopefully. <laughs> um, uh, you know what is, I don't know. Are you familiar with that show, The Wild Wild West? No. <laughs> okay, that was like yeah. a, a TV series. I think it was probably not even, I, think it was, I was just watching reruns when I was a little, little kid on uh, TBS, which is the Turner Broadcasting Station. And they would show it. And in my mind, I was, I'm mimicking the opening credits for like, if you go online and go into YouTube and type in wild, wild west, uh, opening titles or title sequence, you can watch it. And so when I'm design when I design these colors in my mind, I'm doing their, their color sequence. Cause it's almost like a comic book, the way it opens up, they have these panels that are shifting and sliding. It's, it's a really neat amalgamation of illustration and, and what looks like comic book panels. But it's funny after I started doing, canary and doing these colors that i thought was mimicking this tv show i looked at I, I watched the thing on youtube and i'm like it looks nothing like that but that's how my mind had romanticized this you know you know how many years later it's crazy but well, that, that was the genesis of it that's the best right when when yeah. you think you've been influenced by something and then you have but it's completely <laughs> different from what you yeah. actually remember well, I guess that's kind of true. It's like, you know, it's like telling someone a story. And by the time that, you know, 12 people tell the same story down the line, it's a different story. And that's that's basically what happened with the colors. But um, in the beginning, the colors of Canary are a little bit more poppy, 
so you have like, oh, this is a classic Western. This is this kind of 1960s, late 60s Western. And then as the story gets darker and darker, the colors um, tend to get darker and more creepy and, you know, the reds become more horrific. Um, so hopefully the, the color tells a story. You know, I don't know if you ever see those when a, when a cool animation film from Disney or Pixar comes out, they'll do the art of. And, and a lot of times they'll show a storyboarded version, like they call it the color story. And you can they can kind of see what they're trying to do color wise. And it, it really has a lot to do with the storytelling and, and how you want the reader to feel. So I'm not you know, that's that's the joy and the shame of comics is that there's not a dedicated colorist on this who is also you know looking at looking at the script and you know doing it it's up to me to to do my best to kind of tell the color story and be a one-man like animation team um, yeah do you think that is something that you took from their time away from comics i mean i think just all my interest in illustrated um just illustration in general you know um classic illustration like turn of the century advertising art um like bob looking at people like bob peak and robert fawcett all these tremendous illustrators that came before me you know they just you know I, you can tell all the influences of someone like bill sinkevich you know a lot of them he draws from the advertising world you know and puts his own slant on it and that's what makes bill such a unique blessing to the, the comic book world and that's why he's inspired so many people yeah, when I interviewed Bill Sienkiewicz, it's like everyone, all the artists on my friends list were like, <laughs> like, 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 like. Yeah, was that an easy interview? You don't even have to talk. You don't even have to ask some questions. He just, he just has so much to give. He does. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun. I interviewed him once for we have a drink and draw live stream yeah. show on YouTube, and honestly, Dave, uh, Jeff Johnson, and I, and Joe Casada, uh, we don't have to do anything. We just let bill go you know does it, i did an amazing drawing and just talked our ears off for over an hour and we're just hanging on his every word you you get a lot of uh, tips from him about like what tools to use or whatnot you know bill's an interesting guy there's a lot of guys who are humble but there's there's some fake humility in that bill is truly very humble so he would never just go, hey, you should try this or anything. I, I'm sure if I asked him specifically, he's very generous with his time and knowledge. Like Dave and I want to go over. He doesn't live too far from uh, Dave Johnson and I, and we're going to go over there and just watch him paint one day because I, I know, you know, I'll just absorb a lot, you know. I'll, yeah. I'll definitely become a better artist just spending a, you know, half a day with him. Yeah, this is another example of what I was talking about earlier. I hear a lot of you guys, you guys talking about how you you, you guys never think you're good enough, or <laughs> and I'm like, well, there's so many. Titans. Do you know who you are? <laughs> there's these giants in the business. There's unfortunately people like you know Sidkevich out there. You know, it, I I as happy as I am with a lot of the artwork, I have to I have to be realistic about it, and I think it's good to be a good critic and. I, I look at that and I go, that's what I want to aspire to. And if I really want to aspire to that, I have to look at the influences, the people that influence Sienkiewicz, you know, or um, Adam Hughes, or you you name the uh, tremendous artist that Gerald, um, do you know Gerald Perel? I don't no. know. Patel? I think no, it's Perel. So. P-A-R-E-L. Um, tremendous artist. You got to look that guy up. I mean, he's he's a big influence lately, you know. What yeah that's how i finally got kirby it wasn't looking at kirby it was realizing that he was the influence of everybody else that i loved oh yeah yeah and, i'm not a huge like kirby nut but i do like you i kind of recognize what he brings to the table like he just there's a very strong appeal with his action his foreshortening every everything he he did was man you know how could it not affect almost everyone from john busema like John Buscem draws nothing like him. Powerful pages, but they're not as powerful as as Kirby. You know, they're they're more beautiful and they're they're better drawn. But Kirby's Kirby. You know. Do you think the power of Kirby is um, is is exaggerated specifically because he doesn't draw in a realistic style? I mean, it certainly helps. I mean, if you look at someone like Darwin Cook, 
um, you know, he's he's not putting a lot of lines on a on a page, but there's a direct raw appeal to Darwin's work. You know, same thing with someone like Bruce Tim when he occasionally does comics, but Darwin is more graphic sort of every man's Bruce Tim in, in in my estimation. Like he and he's also Darwin in real life was kind of a you know he's almost he's like a tough guy in a way like he was he was like he's a real character in real life um and i think he you know it seeped into his work you know he's a little larger than life personality but i really you know i put a lot of detail into my work but in a perfect world i would draw a little bit more like someone like darwin or or like kirby because i i do think that there's something direct to that i think like when you're watching animation you know, it's not live action, but there's a power a power to that when it's done properly, particularly with anime, you know. But the trade-off for that is something like texture, right? Texture and grittiness, which I feel like for something like Canary really does help because it helps set the mood. Yeah, but imagine if uh, Darwin drew Canary, how cool it would be, you know? that would it, it, I think it would be better, probably. <laughs> See, there's that humility <laughs> again. <laughs> Well, I'm just as a fan, you know, speaking strictly as a fan, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, after seeing the whole breadth of his work, his career, I, that he, he would be very well suited for a Western. I, he did some Jonah Hex, but I, I wasn't, that wasn't some of my favorite work of his. He was, he was trying to do his Mobius and he should have just done Darwin, you know. It sounds like, it sounds like it's very hard to do Mobius. So. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to, I think the only person who comes close is uh, Jeff Darrow and God, what's his name? Um, Landron. Um, yeah. Uh, this Mexican illustrator who's just light years beyond most artists. He started out as a, he, he took Kirby and he took uh, Mobius and, and you know, put him in a pot. And that's in his early work looks just like that. And now, you know, he's next level artist. He's his own guy. Yeah. Uh, when we meet Marshall Holt, he's clearly in the middle of his career. He's already had a lot of accomplishments. Uh, he's got dime novels written after him. The question, my question there is like when you're designing a character like that, when you're talking to Scott about a character like that, have you already, for example, outlined some of the accomplishments that he's had in his career so that you can kind of put that kind of information in your yeah. design? Yeah. He, what kind of made him famous or like a dime star uh, novel hero, a pulp hero was, was these exploits, but it came at a tremendous cost. Like, so he's, he's kind of hardened and, and dark by it. He, he doesn't, he's not, he's not drinking his own punch. Like he, to him, it's, it's just a job and it, it cost him a lot. You know, it ended up costing him and his family. So he's not, you know, he's not like, you know, Wild Bill Hitchcock, he's not going to be in a circus one day, you know, shooting, doing whatever tricks with his revolver. Hopefully he won't. That'd be funny. Maybe maybe he comes a drunk one day and that's what he has to do. But uh, that could we'll leave that up to Scott. Are there any particular uh, Westerns, for example, that you took that you took inspiration from when designing the look of Canary? Well, no, I mean, I, I wouldn't even say Mobius in that sense, because I you know, I didn't pull out the blueberry stuff, for instance. I just started drawing it. I didn't want to get too nervous about the whole thing because I know if I really put too much into it, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do something different with the coloring and have fun and add like a lot of texture. Like the skies are all very painterly. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to give it sort of a, you're not quite in reality. Like this is, it's drawn realistic in a sense, but there's something about it that's otherworldly. So there's a fantasy element to it, maybe on some very small level. I don't know, but I, I'm uh, my favorite Western is probably Pale Rider or Unforgiven. Um, mm. I like those. I mean, when I was a little kid, I loved Shane, which is a cool movie with Alan Ladd. Classic. Yeah, you don't yeah. you don't do just like red skies. There's texture in those red skies. Yeah, I and to me that was what I thought was happening in those Wild West uh, opening title sequences, but apparently not. <laughs> it was just flat color. That's okay. Yeah, no, I'm happy. I'm I'm really happy with it. 
it, when the pages turn out well in Canary, if, if the coloring looks cool, I'm like, okay. Um, you know, not every everyone is, you know, something grand, but when it works, it's, it, it feels very satisfactory. So Canary issue one took us, um, you know, introduced us to Marshall Holt and this mysterious thing that is going on. Uh, and it ends with kind of a tie in to that history that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's got he's he's got to explore that history moving forward. What can people expect from Canary for the next seven issues? Well, it's just, it, it, I would say it's a slow burn like a movie. It has more of a movie feel than a, a comic book as far as the way it's told. So it just every issue, it gets a little bit more intense. Like the second issue, he's kind of welcomed into this strange town. And it's a little bit of a, you know, like the TV show, Twi Twilight Zone. There's a little bit of something off about this town. There's a horrible mining accident that every they lost the majority of the men in the town to this accident. And it's become a bit of a ghost town. Like there's no more mining there. And um, the people that are left are kind of, you know, you know, why are they still there? It's a, it's a, it's a weird place. Um, and everybody seems to have a little bit of an agenda. So it, it's just uh, issue two kind of delivers this uneasy feeling about this place. And you, you feel like you, you ideally you should feel a little bit like, oh, it's a little weird. Number three picks up and uh, there's a lot of action. Number four, I just finished and uh, there's some great reveals in that. And then from there on out, it's just, it's just going to get crazy. So issue five through seven, you know, it's going to be nuts. What's your favorite thing to draw? Is it action or is it the quiet moments? Because I'm looking at uh, this this scene of uh, Marshall Holt looking at uh, kind of standing off with a family. And there's a lot of suspense there, even though they're mostly like just stuff. standing. I, I like that stuff. I like the, the kind of stoic moments. You know, I tend to draw that stuff a lot, like. Um, even when I'm doing like a drink and draw illustration, I'll, I'll draw like, you know, death and Sandman just sitting on a park bench or something. I don't know. I, if you could pull that stuff off and, and kind of deliver a feeling or an emotion that comes with it, I think that's, that's a hard thing to do. So I like the challenge in that. Very cool. Congratulations on the book. I I'm glad you dig it. Thank you. I love it. Um, I also saw that you did a cover for Frank Frazetta's Death Dealer. <laughs> yeah, that was a that, that was nerve wracking. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask how that was. <laughs> well, a big hero of mine. So when I got asked to do that, particularly you know Death Dealer, which is his most famous, that was you know. I, I, luckily, I get to do another one. I, I was happy how that cover came out, but I, hopefully, I, the jitters are away, and now I can just you know go crazy and do my own version without being intimidated by Frazetta and the, the ghost of Frazetta, the legacy. Well, uh, how did you get that gig? Was it through his uh, granddaughter? Uh, Sarah? No. Um, the, the publisher uh, contacted me and I, I think because of that, you know, I, I, I tend to do a lot of Conan inspired artwork. I, I think they're like, Oh, we need someone who's, who's in that genre. So uh that, that kind of helped. I've done a little bit of Conan. I haven't done that much actual Conan work, but uh, it's a big, obviously a big influence and favorite of mine. What do you think of the fact that um, they're doing Frazetta stuff now? You know, like I well, feel they like tried it a few, they tried it a few times. There was this Frazetta Illustrated magazine for a while. There was uh, Glenn Danzig had, had um, done some Frazetta. He did a Death Dealer comic in the 90s. Um, so there's been some stuff. They, this this seems to be the most successful um, version of it. I, I'm I'm really happy. I mean, it's really it's really cool that the legacy lives on and more people can be inspired by Frazetta's artwork. I mean, imagine doing one drawing, you know, and it just leading into all that. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. 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 And also, you are in fact the the organizer of Drink and Draw. Or is organizer uh, the right yeah, word? I mean, well, we all take we all take charge. I mean, I, I I started that YouTube channel, but Drink and Draw was just a, a thing that Dave, Jeff, and I started in Los Angeles in 2005 just to hang out with each other. And then, you know, I'm sure there's Drink and Draw chapters in the Philippines, if I'm not mistaken. You know, they're everywhere now. It's mm -hmm. it's crazy. It's a worldwide thing. Like I could go to Paris, and I know the Drink and Draw people over there. It's nuts. Yeah. Would you like to? 
plug the YouTube channel? Oh yeah, it's called the Original Drink and Draw Social Club. Uh, we we do regular uh, engagements each each week. We, it started because of the pandemic, like we couldn't go out to a tavern or bar and draw anymore. So we're like, what are we going to do? Um, it just it worked out that way. We have guests on the show a lot of times. Uh, everybody kind of gives each other a hard time, just like you would if you're with your buddies hanging out. Not as much drinking goes on during the show as it would if we were in a bar, but. <laughs> Um, the drawing certainly <laughs> we, we spend more time on the drawing let's put it that way yeah. uh, uh, if you were in a bar how how would the quality of the drawing be as time goes by <laughs> a little shoddy i think i mean we had fun there's there's two coffee table books that came out and you can kind of see like the first the first one was um you know more just everybody hanging out just drawing whatever while we're talking the second one, we're like, well, wow, we have to, you know, there's, it came a little bit competitive with the three of us. So I think the drawing quality increased. And now, you know, because of the YouTube nature and, you know, people see the drawings that we do on there and then, uh, you know, collectors will say how much is that, you know, they want to buy the, the pieces. So the quality keeps going up, which is a good thing. I oh, guess. which is great. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Does that kind of friendly competition keep you guys on your toes or maybe too much? <laughs> Yeah, especially with Dave and I. Dave and I are always trying to one-up each other. Really? Yeah, and, and Dave, you know, Dave Johnson's probably one of the best cover artists in the business, so he definitely keeps me on my feet. So are you. Oh, well, I don't know if I'd go that far, but I'm, I'm going to, I'll get, maybe I'll get there. If I don't, I don't, you know, it's just something to aspire to. Would Dave Johnson say that about you? I, Dave likes my work. So that's that's a big compliment. <laughs> so that makes, I mean, we're also friends. Maybe he just doesn't want to hurt my feelings. So, um, but yeah, no. D Dave and I regularly will send each other our our artwork and our covers, um, and we get feedback on it. So we're very critical of each other, but in a in a way that we want to see each other grow. Um, but you know, Dave Dave's art. You know, Dave if he never improved, he's still Dave Johnson. You know. How important is that to an artist? For, for even like, let's say for a st an artist is starting out, just having that kind of network that will give you that kind of honest feedback. I think it's, to me, I can only speak from personal experience, is very important because, you know, whether you're doing artwork or whether you're writing or whether in any aspect of your job or, or even physical training, if you're an athlete, I think you tend to have a very myopic sort of viewpoint of that. And you see it from your lens and it's, it's hard to see the big picture of things. And I think having a, having another mentor or friend or even partner in life can, can help give perspective or go, you know what, that looks off. And you're like, no, you know, there's ego involved. So a lot of times you'll, you'll fight back and push back and go, you don't understand. I'm trying to do this, but, um, you know, I, it, it certainly helped me with my career and I, I have a very critical eye when it comes to my own work, but you know, I miss things too. And it's nice to have someone like Dave give me the beat down and tell me how awful it could be. <laughs> you know, it's kind of helpful. It's of course, nice. when you're, when you're drawing something and you're in the middle of it, you don't really see it objectively. No, um, you, you lose all objectivity. That's what I was, you said it much better in like three uh, words that we, what <laughs> I tried to say. You know? But but how many days, for example, like if you leave it alone, how many days before you can look at it and like kind of see about you know, two sort of... days, two days. And I go, this is like I just did a um, in the background on, on that monitor. I did a Red Sonia cover and I was delighted with it. I thought some little things were off in the eyes. And luckily, enough days went past. I was like, OK, this is what I did wrong. And so I had enough time to fix it before I sent it into um, Dynamite Comics. And then, you know, about a, a month from now, I'll hate the whole thing in general. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just how it goes. That's, that's, I'm sure every artist is like that. They're like, oh, you see every mistake, you know. I should have done that differently. <laughs> yeah. But that's so why I, I should have been a dentist. That is how, what I always come back to. Well, yeah, you know, if you don't do something perfectly as a dentist, somebody can come after you. Yeah, you get sued. This <laughs> I just might not get hired again, you know. Is it, is it, uh, is it is it a thing where you i was gonna say something oh yeah perfectionism is is is, uh, is the enemy isn't it it is i think it is the enemy i think you have to like to come back to kirby kirby would say instead of trying to make that page perfect 
learn what you can from that page and put it into the next one. Like, obviously, if you have the time to, if there's some blatant error, yeah, fix fix that thing if, if time permits. But, you know, I think what sabotages a lot of artists is they'll spend way too long on a page or a cover. And, you know, in that time, they could have done four covers, you know, and experiences. I mean, if you're thinking of it as like a basketball player, that's how many more free throws. You're Every time you're doing it, you're training those muscles in your mind to to do it better. So I think the more you do comics, the more you draw, the more drawings you have under your belt is going to increase, you know, how you look at it. It's like, I guess, being an actor, like if you run the same play for the rest of your life, you, you know, you're never going to know how to play a different type of character. And that's the joy of being an actor. You can, you can play that one character like perfectly for the rest of yeah, your life, but that's it. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. It was great talking to you. It was great talking to you as well. Congratulations. You can you guys can get Canary on Comixology uh, or Amazon, I guess it is yeah. now. So and then eventually on, from Dark Horse, they'll collect the whole thing. And, and we're going to do it, an artist edition version of the book. So like the full size pages that um, you can check out without color. That's still you, though, the color. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. Dan Panosian, everyone. Thanks, you.